these animals are from all over the world. So you're going to be seeing an animal tonight called Sinoceratops. It is a ceratopsian, which means the guys with the frills and the horns on their faces, that's actually from China. We have Allosaurus fragilis, which you're going to get to see. That one's from North America. But we have them from all over the place. They're very common um, all around the world. We find them on every continent, even Antarctica. We certainly can't do it now. Um, what we do have, I guess, a two-part question. Would we ever expect to be able to extract blood from a mosquito in amber, which we do have. I mean, that's not completely out there. Um, yeah, honestly, you're taking something out of another animal's stomach, so you're going to be getting mosquito DNA, and it's going to be degraded because it was in its stomach. So that's maybe not a great plan, but there's a lot of really interesting research right now coming out of Mary Schweitzer's lab where they're actually extracting proteins. And it was really interesting because the first time she came to a professional conference and she talked about it, everybody's like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what you're getting out of those bones, but it, it can't be dinosaur proteins. Those are, that's ridiculous. But then she went back and she did what scientists do. It's like, okay, what's everybody's criticisms? Well, let's test them in the lab and see. And she comes back the next year and she's like, well, it's not fungus. You know, it's not any of these other things. My graduate student didn't sneeze on it. Whatever this is, is highly convergent with birds. So this seems to be the real deal. But again, it is highly degraded. Um, it's still very interesting. It's still really filling in that bird to dinosaur connection that we've had figured out from the 1970s in the work of Ostrom on, but it just solidifies that idea. Will we ever be at the point where we could have an entire strain of the genome of a dinosaur? I hate to say never because we're always surprising ourselves with new discoveries, but right now we simply don't have that. There is a project out there, and I love the name, it's adorable, it's called Chickenosaurus. And uh, <laughs> when you think about a lot of genetic research, when they're wanting to understand, say, health conditions in humans, they don't work on humans. They'll look at things like chickens or sharks or rays or you know, fruit flies, all kinds of different things and looking at which genes are being affected. So what they're basically doing in this project is they're studying chickens, and they're trying to figure out which genes would, for example, um, make their feet look a little bit more dinosaur-y, or make their jaw look a little bit more dinosaur -y. to sort of reverse engineer and understand the kinds of mutations that would have led from something that looks like a T-Rex to something that looks like a chicken. Um, is that a real sort of non-avian dinosaur? Not exactly, not really. <laughs> um, but it does give us some really interesting insights into what was actually going on with the DNA. Um, so it's a really cool project. It's just sometimes a little, we're not trying to actually reverse engineer any kind of, a, you can't really do that. Beautiful fossils like Sinoceropteryx, and you can see it's, they're completely feathered. We also have evidence from the bones. If you actually look at a Thanksgiving turkey, they have little bumps down their arms where the fil like feathers actually come in and attach. If you look at, you know, no kidding, Velociraptor, it's got little bumps down the same bone on its arms. We know it had feathers attaching there, so these things would have been heavily feathered. And I sometimes joke about this because, you know, one of the arguments that I do admit I kind of roll my eyes about is, like, you can't feather up the dinosaurs, it'll ruin my childhood. They, they won't look scary anymore. It's like, have you guys ever irritated a goose? Um, they're still scary, <laughs> so even when they have feathers on them. But no, we, we do have direct evidence. We have feathers preserved in the fossil record. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen sometimes. I actually snuck in a cast of one of the Archaeopteryx fossils that I can pull out and show you guys, but those were found in Germany, and they also have beautiful feather impressions on them. Color is really tricky. Um, you were talking about Ice Age stuff, and we can sometimes cheat, because when there were people around, they sometimes painted things on cave walls, and we can say, fabulous, that's what that horse used to look like, but we can't do that with dinosaurs. So most of the time, it's artistic license. You'll notice that a lot of times they seem to be inspired by specific animals. So Archaeopteryx, old reconstructions, often looked like a blue jay, and it just sort of became the fashion. Somebody did that, everyone's like, yeah, blue jay. But, again, things that used to be speculation, things that we would just sit around and just spitball, like, oh, I wonder what color this thing was, have moved into the realm of a testable hypothesis with new discoveries and new technology. There are other dinosaurs that have, again, that sort of carbonized striping to them. 
So Edmontosaurus, the duckbill that I mentioned before, we're pretty certain it had a striped tail because we see this color banding in these unusually well-preserved fossils. But the overwhelming majority of dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs, we're just not sure. Um, now we can look at modern birds and we say, yeah, some of these guys get to be pretty wildly colored. So with this shift in looking at these animals, going from early 20th century, they're slow and boring and dumb and lived in swamps, to a more modern interpretation of smart, they're fast, they're social, they're much more bird-like, we start to see that reflected in the paleo art and all of a sudden we see bright colors and interesting new things like that. So it's, it's sort of reflecting the shift in the field.